Hello and welcome to the Miko Bits Show. If you struggle to keep up with DeFi and Bitcoin and blockchain, uh, this is your show. Uh, if you're interested and you want to keep up with these topics, but you're a pretty busy person, feel free to hit the subscribe button. You know, it really helps us out as well as a channel. So please do join in our community. So today uh, we're bringing you someone from the forefront of the DeFi revolution. This is Seb. He's the founder of ZapperFi. So uh, Zapper.Fi is the web URL. Uh, uh, affectionately known in the DeFi community as Zapper is really this incredibly powerful user uh, experience and interface for DeFi, not just at the UI layer, but actually deeper in the middleware layer where you can actually get these things called zaps and zaps take care of like so many complicated machinations and problems in DeFi, you know, and give the user this incredibly smooth ride. Uh, you know, I can confidently say this because, you know, I'm a, I'm a user. Uh, I don't have any financial interest to disclose. It's a, uh, or, you know, I don't have any financial interest or business relationship. I'm just a big fan of this product and, you know, great, great company, great product. So, you know, with that in mind, uh, you know, please keep in mind this is an opinion and entertainment show. It's not intended to be investment advice. We will talk about cryptographic assets, obviously, but it is not investment advice. So, you know, without uh, further ado, uh, here's Seb. Hey, Miko, great to be here. Yeah, wonderful to have you on the show. So the first segment we often talk about is the news. And the latest news is really that Ethereum seems to be on a tear. So one of the things that I'd love to get from your perspective is really understanding, you know, your your way of looking at what's happening in the Ethereum world. Yeah, I mean, that's the, like that's that's a great question. Um, I think like uh, it's definitely feel feeling a bit manic uh, right now. Um, the thing is like there's been a lot of building that happened in, like the past two three years that kind of went uh, unnoticed, and the, the the market conditions right now are definitely very different from what they were in 2017. Uh, you look at the price of Ether, and it's kind of like sitting uh, close to the all time highs in 2017. And in 2017, it wasn't backed by much actual usage and value. Now we're in a much different scenario. At the same time, like I have no idea what's going to happen, but I do see a lot of people um, gaining interest into DeFi, um, like much more than imagined, much more quickly. Um, and I think perhaps it's kind of accelerated by the current, um, uh, obviously COVID and yeah, the, the current economic um, status of the world. Like you see governments printing a ton of money, uh, a bit of distrust going on with banks, obviously. Um, and the whole like GME thing too, I think kind of propelled a lot of attention towards the space. Yeah, one thing that's happening locally that I think is interesting to observe is that the CME uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange is launching an Ethereum's futures product. And that product is coming, uh, I think it is in this month, February. So I think it's very soon. Uh, it is similar. It's interesting that a comparable product for Bitcoin was actually launched and it actually caused the price of Bitcoin to decline uh, from its all time high. So it's a, you know, people are watching this. Ethereum futures are not necessarily kind of universally bullish, especially as you introduce very kind of more traditional investors into the space who may not have the same kind of values as the Ethereum maximalists and the exciting early adopter types do. So, um, yeah, so I think it's an interesting development. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, it's a, it's a bit neither here nor there, but let's all watch to see what happens. And, you know, I think it's good to keep abreast of these developments. So, Let's get straight into Zapper. So, uh, you know, uh, I'm, a, I, I'm a user and fan, so I know about this, but I'd love to hear you describe, like, what problem do you solve with Zapper? Um, so because DeFi is kind of like this uh, open internet of, of finance, right? Um, there's, a, there's kind of an explosion of, you know, different protocols and product, um, products in DeFi kind of, you know, popping up. Um, and since everything is kind of shared and open, you know, people kind of experiment here and there, they uh, invest in this platform, they use another. And the the immediate problem that comes with that type of usage is it becomes kind of like a mess to be able to track your portfolio and your balances. Um, 
And my first use case for Zapper was actually to solve a problem that I had. Um, and that was a year ago. And I was actually, you know, a user back then. I still am a user right now, but uh, I was just, you know, checking out different platforms, putting money here and there. And eventually, yeah, it became impossible to like track all my balances. Um, so the goal of Zapper is really just to be this one-stop shop, this one place where you can really track all your investments um, that you're doing in DeFi on top of actually being able to do transactions. So the other part uh, that we help solving is, um, you know, as a user, it can be kind of like hard to kind of see all the opportunities that are going and even just being able to like uh, use the different websites can it can be like a pretty uh, hindering user experience. So on top of like just being able to read your portfolio, you can actually do transactions directly from Zapper. So we have the exchange where you can go from token A to token B. Uh, there's also the pool section where you could easily add um, liquidity to a pool uh, from a bunch of different protocols. So there's Uniswap, SushiSwap, Balancer, Curve, uh, and Bancor. And um, there's also a farm tab. So it's really like we're aggregating a bunch of investment part opportunities in one simple UI um, that kind of reduces a lot of the overhead uh, in DeFi, which is being able to track everything that's going on and be, like having to move from one website to the other. Yeah, so it's really fascinating. I mean, my experience of it is there's a kind of a mashup vibe to it. It feels, I mean, the way you're describing it almost feels like a, almost like a, Robin Hood for DeFi, you know, like this kind of really like go there, have fun, it'll be awesome type of an experience, you know, for, for everyone, right? So anyone can really get involved. It's not that complicated. And obviously it gets orders of magnitude less complicated if you use uh, Zapper. So, you know, I think that's that's exciting and it's great to hear. But, you know, another mindset that you could look at Zapper from is, you know, and this may be a little more of a nerdy mindset, but like if you think about um, Etherscan, right? So like in a way there's, it's, you know, and obviously Etherscan is a layer one, you know, Ether solution, but it's kind of almost like an Etherscan for DeFi. I, I don't know if that's a fair way of yep. looking at it. I mean, it's like a, a, a fancy Etherscan because on Etherscan you can do a lot of you know, you can do transactions if you want to. I think that's like a hidden feature that not a lot of people know about, but it's mostly intended for like developers, right? Um, so it's um, standing very uh, low in the stack, like you have Etherscan, and then uh, you have, sorry, Ethereum, and then Etherscan kind of sitting on like this raw user in interface to interact with the blockchain. And like we're much higher up with a bunch of uh, much more abstraction and much more geared and interpreted towards the DeFi audience. Well, I think one of the wonderful use cases when you go into the Etherscan type of use case is that uh, people can really uh, not just uh, do their own thing, you know, look at their own wallet and keep track of their own business. They can actually do a little whale watching, right? And this yep. is an incredibly powerful use case, right? Because if you really want to learn what people are up to uh, on chain, you can get, and you know, obviously DeFi is entirely on chain, right? So, you know, yep. in a sense, there's no DeFi dark pool, like it's all light pool, right? So it just means that like, you can learn a, a lot. You can learn an incredible lot, you know, by looking at kind of super whale positions, you know, and really understanding kind of different types, right? So that it's almost like uh, if you're going whale watching, you know, you, you see different whale species, right? So you can kind of look and be like, oh, wow. Like, you know, <laughs> some of these DeFi players and wallets, like you might not know who they are, but like, you know, you might think, well, okay, this looks very institutional, right? And in a sense, you can kind of look at sort of the complexity of an asset of a wallet and you can kind of understand kind of how professional you know, some of these players can be, you know, and sometimes it's just like an ETH super whale, you know, and you look in there and they have some crypto kitties in there too, you know, so it's that, that probably suggests maybe a little more personal uh, yeah. account, even I, though it may be very large, right? So, yeah. And I think honestly, that's, so that's the use case that a lot of people use on Zapper, just being able to like uh, watch the whale addresses. And I'd say like, it's a very important part of DeFi because it reduces the information asymmetry. You're able to see what everyone is doing and draw your own conclusions for it. And I think that's powerful because if you look at traditional finance, it's very opaque. Like, I don't know exactly if Goldman Sachs is actually betting against me. I don't know what their positions are, right? Yeah. They could say something 
um, uh, publicly and do something else privately. Like Jamie Dimon. So, yeah, no, exactly. So it's very hard to understand wh what's going on. And now we have this very transparent system um, that you could see exactly how all of the, the DeFi hedge funds are functioning, all the, you know, investors are doing. Um, and you can look at them and draw your own conclusions, which is very important and a healthy part of a, of a market. Yeah, it's a it's incredible and it's kind of a powerful knowledge transfer, right? Like cuz for me, like I've been in open source software for decades, you know, and nice. to me that community is so interesting and valuable, you know. But the thing that Satoshi did is added almost like an open source DevOps, right? Which is that running servers has never been a charity you know, that you can give away. But, you know, if you run Bitcoin nodes, you're basically running server infrastructure for Bitcoin where you get reward in Bitcoin, right? There's no other yep. way to do it other than how he did it, right? But the thing that's fascinating is he also created open source data, right? Which is that the actual runtime operational data of Bitcoin is open and it's open source, you know, but the thing that I think is so interesting about Zapper and tools like Zapper is that you can kind of like you can look at it like a almost like a github not for the open source code but a github for the open source financial information or financial behavior right so you know to me this idea that it's all sitting there for everyone to learn and know it's just fantastic right because you can't understand the thing that's so beautiful about this op it's like an open book exam you know you, if you just look at people's positions you can really get like a you know this is all like super powerful education right because you can just look at them and be like what are they thinking right and obviously you know some of these very few like super sophisticated whale class investors are like dumb you know like they they just don't <laughs> they don't stay a lot you know they don't stay like that if they're dumb right so so you know yep. you can just watch them you know and obviously if you see they're tanking over the last couple of years then you can be like okay maybe this maybe this one is dumb but like generally they're not so like you know pay attention and, and learn learn something so tell me a bit about your numbers like uh you know about like traction and how you know how's the project going and you know it seems like uh you got a lot of people using it yeah we we do we do um so on christmas day we passed the one billion in volume uh mark Beautiful. so yeah, that, that's awesome. And what's even better, I guess, is since then we did $500 million in volume. So in only one month, we kind of did half than the seven months before that. Um, so there's definitely an accelerating uh, trend on our side. We're seeing a lot of growth around the number of transactions going through on Zapper. Um, and also just the amount of people that are using Zapper to, to read their portfolio. Because, I mean, the way we kind of see it is like there's, there's two sides of Zapper, right? There's the read and there's the write side. Um, the write, I'm meaning like actually doing transactions. And, and so something um, like understanding your investments and being able to track them is something you do on a daily basis. Like you're, you're gonna open up Zapper all day. And then after that, well, if you're opening up Zapper every day, then well, oh, I actually, look, they have some, um, I can actually do transactions here. And that kind of like creates this, this flywheel um, where the more people that just land on Zapper to read balances, which is what everyone in DeFi needs, uh, actually start to do transactions and use less and less the underlying protocols. One example is Uniswap. Uniswap obviously has a, a lot of usage, but what we've seen on our side is a lot of users that never actually interacted with Uniswap directly Zapper has been the only place where they actually interacted with Uniswap, which is interesting because in the beginning, that wasn't the case at all. Everyone that used Zapper actually had used Uniswap in the past, but now we're kind of seeing a shift where uh, the introduction to most of these underlying products comes from Zapper itself. That's beautiful. And it's exciting, right? Because it means that you're accessing and introducing new players, new users into the space. So um, tell me a bit about like, what is your secret or your unfair advantage? So, you know, we'd love to kind of understand a little bit about that. Um, like, honestly, there's not really a secret. Hmm. Um, it's, uh, 
Yeah, I, I honestly like we we just work really hard uh, on adding a bunch of new protocols integration. Like I, I can say, like our secret well, is early on, like when we're doing Zapper, um, I think like the portfolio aspect of it, like just being able to track the balances wasn't as obvious because most DeFi users were um, very knowledgeable and they didn't need that solution as much as they needed it today. And I think like the fact that the space was so void of any products like that um, just created just an opening for us to just like, just like, because when you, you go at the basics and I kind of going back to my earlier point is you need to, everyone needs to understand their portfolio. So if you can be that place where people understand their portfolio, it just unlocks so many possibilities and just attracts so much value. It kind of by by default makes us like a the top of funnel entry for DeFi. Um, so it, it does become a very powerful position to be in. And I think early on, not a lot of people realize that. That's why we've been working so on, on, on adding protocol integrations very quickly is because that's how you uh, suck in people into to Zapper. Yeah, that's exciting. I mean, in a sense, it's a bit like uh, Blockfolio is for kind of a traditional uh, current cryptocurrency uh, market. So that that's a neat that's a neat way of looking at it, right? Is that yeah, you and have... Blockfolio, like they, I thought they were a bit. So I think last week, like they announced that you can actually buy right uh, invest directly on Blockfolio. And to me, that's like, well, that's a bit slow to do that because you had a, a huge user base that was just staying like static. On yeah, your Blockfolio got acquired by an exchange, yep. so you know it. It's that's why, right? So I think it, it, it. They never got there themselves, and I think you know the thing that's exciting about what you're doing is that you know you're actually adding. Uh, direct transactional abilities, you know, so it's not just kind of, oh, let's look at things, you know, looking at things yeah. is interesting. And it's a, obviously it's the place where people, people have to look at things every day, right? So looking at things is important, but obviously doing things is like where, where it's at. So I think, you know, that's, that's big. So um, tell me about kind of what you're excited about right now. What are your sources of inspiration? It can be personal or professional. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, so first, like on a D uh, DeFi level, uh, I'm excited by a number of things. Um, what I'm really interested in is what is what wasn't possible in traditional finance that is now possible in DeFi. And I think a lot of products like kind of look at um, what is in traditional finance to try to port it into DeFi. And I think that's great. There's a lot of lessons to learn. There's a lot of... Um, yeah, basically lessons to learn from traditional finance. And the problem is like, um, like, you know, the first cars, like they were um, modeled after horse carriages. Nice. And that was kind of like, not right. That's like not the best design for a car, a horse carriage, but that was the only frame of mind that people had when they were designing the first cars. And I feel like right now we're doing like the same thing where we're taking, this is traditional finance. We just need to pour it into DeFi. But there's just so many new use cases um, that we could build with DeFi, so many innovative products. So I'm really interested in looking at these weird Frankenstein products. Like we've seen a surge in Elastic Finance. We've seen a surge in Senior Edge Coins. Um, we're just going to see more of these and a lot of them are going to fail. So, so um, those are really interesting buzzwords. So I'd love for you to unpack them. So please talk a yeah. little bit about uh, Elastic Finance. And then the next one would be, please talk about Senior Ridge coins. Yeah, so Elastic Finance has been kind of like this term by Ampleforth because they were really the pioneers uh, behind it. Um, now, this is like not uh, endorsement or anything. I'm just really a geek and, and curious about these things. Yeah. Uh, basically, basically, Elastic Finance kind of posed, well, what if instead of the price adjusting for an asset when there's higher demand, why don't we adjust the supply uh, like automatically instead? Um, so basically before, like in traditional and the traditional world, it's very hard to like change the supply automatically for everyone at once, right? The Federal Reserve kind of tries to do that, but it's very hard. Like it's not like when they print money, it kind of distributes to everyone equally. Yeah. But in DeFi, it is possible. So when there's a expansion in Ampleforce, so when the demand goes high, 
the supply is elastically distributed to everyone at the same time on the same level, which is super interesting. Yeah, that's now, amazing. Does this does this have a use case? I have no idea. But these are the type of experience I, I'm really interested in because it unlocks something new that wasn't possible before. And I think there is possibly a use case for um, assets that their supply is adjustable instead of the price. And I think like I might become like a bit philosoph um, philosophical about this is that um, you know, price and supply are kind of like the same thing in a way. Like they're they're both very attached, um, and sure. um, the supply is perhaps just a, a different variable to like express express value. Um, so it'd be it'll be super interesting to look at. Then the other thing is senior edge coins, which is kind of like a derived from elastic finance. Um, we've seen a, a bunch of these new um, experiments pop in like empty set dollar, a dynamic set dollar. And basically what they are is kind of like this decentralized federal reserve. Um, so the goal of them is to be exactly uh, pegged to a dollar. And the reason why, like, I guess the, the first question poses, why do we need to have another stable coin? Now, the, I, I guess like the main problem that exists in the market is like most stable coins that exist are very centralized. You have USDC, you have USDT. Um, if something somehow happens to them or if they become even more regulated, we're gonna need something else that is kind of like out of control from the, these central authorities. We have DAI. The problem with DAI is that it's kind of capped by the collateral that is backing it. So there is a scaling issue. Like if DAI wants to scale, they have to add just a bunch of collateral. Sure. So with um, seniorage uh, coins, they actually, they're kind of like on this spectrum. So some of them do have collateral, some of them don't. Empty set dollar is an example of a seniorage coin that does have, doesn't have any collateral. What that means is that it, it can scale as much as it wants. Like it could go to infinity. Um, at the same time, if there's no collateral, it's hard to maintain a uh, peg to $1. So there's a bunch of game theory on mechanics for people when it's above a dollar to sell and below a dollar to buy. Uh, now, from what we see so far, uh, just looking at empty set and dynamic set dollar, like they're way below peg. So they're in a way in a broken state right now. But what's interesting is there's a community rallied beh behind them that are trying these different experiments and pushing out these new ideas. Um, perhaps they're going to have a small amount of collateral backing it. We'll see. Um, but yeah, those are definitely uh, interesting and uh, things I'm, I'm looking into right now. Yeah, I like this because in a way, like one of the things that happens in the DeFi tribe is that there are many sub-tribes, right? So, yep. you know, I think one of the pronunciations people give to DeFi is DeFi. So I've heard people talk, you know, you pronounce it that way. And in a sense, like that's kind of the tribe that I think of as sort of a, there's sort of a degen sub-tribe there, which is kind of like what I call FU money, you know, and it's funny because it's not traditional. It's actually directed at money itself, right? So it's sort of this, yep. uh, you know, so in a, in a sense, if you look at the, like something like based, which is sort of an ample fourth, you know, elastic supply coin is uh, characterized by their meme scape as a game of chicken, right? So essentially the yep. rebase period is looked at as this kind of brinksmanship game where people can get exploded or unexploded, you know? So in, in a way it takes kind of this yam apocalypse type of event and it turns it into this kind of like exciting danger game you know and so in a way like that element of it is an attempt to kind of disrupt or implode or play with money so it's almost like a monopoly money or play money scenario where there's gaming and game mechanics and you know yep. obviously gamification and you know uh game theory so i think that that those are all very very interesting uh, the development. So, you know, I think we should, we should definitely keep an eye on, on these things. So kind of a perfect segue to my pocket pick segment, which is, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, obviously not investment advice, but do you think that there are, you know, what are your kind of favorite pet projects? You know, you mentioned these projects from an experimental perspective, but what about from a kind of a promising this perspective? Uh, yeah, I honestly, I don't know. Like, I mean, I, 
So from an investment perspective, it's very different from how I, I, I picture stuff very differently from yeah, like things I'm just course. curious on an experimental way. So on an investment side, I mean, I'm more on like the conservative, um, like I, I personally look at projects I use myself um, and that I understand the problem. So for me, like Uniswap, like it's obvious yes. to me, like it's a no brainer, you know, Aave yeah. Ave as well. Yeah. Um, now in terms of like newer ones that have appeared, like, well, kind of part of the story uh, from why I built Zapper is I was like a synthetic Spartan. So I was in the community there uh, for a while. Wonderful. And um, there's a bunch of different products that are kind of like building on top of it. And uh, one I like in particular is uh, the hedge. Yeah, I think that's how you say it which is like this decentralized hedge fund uh, protocol built on top of synthetic. So people, anyone could basically build their own kind of basket of synthetics and other people can invest in them, which is really cool. Um, and it's very open. Like you can see, it's kind of a bit like token sets, but it's really leveraging what you can do with synthetics. Um, really interesting. Um, yeah, I guess that would be it. I mean, I, I'm mostly in, you know, the DeFi blue chips, as you'd say. Wonderful, wonderful. And, uh, you know, uh, as far as kind of giving some shout outs, like, you know, do you have any folks in mind, folks that you admire in the industry or folks that you think have done uh, you a good turn or people that you like? Yeah, I mean, well, to me, like, I, I admire a lot of um, the folks at Uniswap. Yeah. Um, I mean, they they built their product well hayden in particular yes. in um in a bear market and uh he really he really like not necessarily like uh invented the amm but he really like i mean you might as well say he invented the amm i well, um, you could probably give credit to bancor uh you know there oh no yeah that that is that is fair i i think uh well popularized it yes. uh, and made it really mainstream in defi um and i mean yeah uh, Uniswap, uh, I love the products, Stani, uh, yes. Kane, uh, you know, all really, they're all nice and very good people. And I think that's important to have um, as part of the leadership, uh, the people you look up to in DeFi have these these good people building because you, you don't want to kind of repeat the same mistakes that we did in traditional finance and just have people that are trying to like uh, gather as much as resources for themselves. They're all like very community oriented um, and um, yeah, want as as many people to build and help as many. Like Kane, for example, I mean, he he helped me a lot uh, with uh, Def uh, DeFi Snap, which was the precursor to Zapper at that time. Um, I mean, he offered feedback, and you know, so these builders have been very engaged with their community, and encouraging people to build like me. So that's definitely an inspiration and something I want to kind of pay it forward for people that want to like build on Zapper or, or are interested to, to launch new products in DeFi. I love that. And, uh, you know, I think it's great. Uh, you know, the thing that's been wonderful is that, you know, you're really naming a lot of people who we have had on the show, uh, which means that they're generous with their time. They're generous with their information that they have, and they just really want to be sharing to the world and the community. So, you know, really appreciate those people. Uh, thanks for those shout outs. Really uh, spot on and you know, just really wonderful, great people. So um, I guess for, for me, like what's uh, what's 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 the big idea? <laughs> uh, so, you know, this segment is always it's about kind of the thing that is really kind of a life purpose thing. And, you know, how do you, what's your big idea? How do you see this thing? Yeah. Um, so this is something I, I've been thinking a lot about um, and it might be contrarian or might not be in a way, but I, I kind of kind of introduce it by talking about like how I and how my friends and how the people around me I've seen kind of look at DeFi. And so in a traditional setting, you kind of see, well, oh, finance is too complicated for me. You know, there's just going to be some, some, someone else is going to manage my money and it's just too complicated. And I think a lot of people still think that about DeFi. It's, DeFi is going to be about, oh, there's just going to be people that are going to manage money for me. Um, I still like finances in for me. Like, yeah, like I, I, won't, I won't do it. You know, what I see at its, at, at its core, like what DeFi is and what blockchain enables is humans need a way to communicate value. 
Um, and it's something everyone does. Kids do it, they trade Pokemon cards. Um, everyone understands how to communicate value. Now, traditional finance is very opaque, very hard to understand, very hard to communicate communicate value. But with DeFi, you kind of like scratch that all together and you have this system where you increase the bandwidth and make it very easy for humans to coordinate and communicate value. So what I think is more people are going to be interested in finance, but not finance as we currently know it in the tra traditional world, but this new financial system that we're building. Uh, I can look at my friends and they've been way more interested in finance than I ever thought they'd be. I have been more interested in finance since I learned about DeFi. And what I see is this technology empowers people to actually do their own investments, learn more about finance. Um, and what I see is kind of echoing be before the interview, you talked about Steve Jobs talking about personal computing. Yeah. Well, I kind of see a parallel, a parallel here where it empowers people to be more knowledgeable of, about finance. It empowers them to be uh, a better vehicle to communicate value and understand value. Um, and to me, that is super powerful. And I think the notion that finance is something that only a few people understand and, you know, you're just going to have someone manage, you know, your, your retirement portfolio. To me, that is not what's going to happen. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically like how I think of DeFi in the future. I, I love it. I love it. So, uh, you know, just to clarify, you know, my kind of mission, if you go to Miko.com, you can see that, uh, I, I like to say open source financial infrastructure will make the world more consensual, fair, just, inclusive, transparent, and innovative, right? That's really kind of like my own ethos, right? So what, what you're describing is a level of kind of personal empowerment, right? And I think to me, it fits and it kind of may be why I was so attracted to Zapper as a user, right? Because I think that there is alignment there. And, you know, for me, I think that this kind of, feeling is very empowering right and in a sense this ability to see what others are doing and to kind of really you know like it's not even like people talk about like uh social trading you know and they talk about like eToro yeah. and things like oh i can see what other people are trading as if that were kind of like a you know a cool feature but it's like it's not a feature it just that's it like that's how that's the yep. entire system like the entire system is based on that and that that's you know it's it's something you can't take away right so that that's yep. that's powerful and to me like you've built an incredible panopticon or you know telescope or microscope i don't know how to describe it but it's it's a powerful system that enables people to see the financial world and to kind of ask the right questions so i i think that's 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 wonderful. Yeah, and I think people are curious. Like, I think, you know, if you look at Facebook and a bunch of other products, they, they help kind of people look at what others are posting and basically kind of opened up the bandwidth for communication between people. And you didn't need to, like, look at how you communicate as, like, a strict one-on-one -on -one basis. It can also be, like, oh, they posted this, oh, I know, like, oh, okay, they went on vacation, everything. And kind of DeFi is in a way similar where you have this open system where you can really see what everyone is doing. You can learn from them. Um, so it, it is kind of like similar in that way. That's wonderful. I mean, to me, when I think about this kind of like evolution and the evolution of like society and social behavior, you know, I think that that is really almost like moving into a new era because, you know, the thing that's so fascinating about this kind of uh, feeling is, is it's sort of about the evolution of trust, right? And I think if you look at the, you alluded to the era of the ICO, right? And how uh, people were trusting things and people they never met, <clears throat> things that had, hadn't even been built and things that like, you know, so, so the thing that's beautiful about the ethos of DeFi is that people are investing in things that have been built, you know, and yep. in a sense, the thing that kind of becomes a proxy for trust is really trusting what you can see. Like you trust your own self, you trust your own eyes, your evidence, you trust the code, the automation, like you can see everything, right? So it's sort of like, what's there to mistrust? Nobody can hide anything from you. I mean, that's the- Yeah, and often it. you even invest in products you use yourself. 
Yes, that's a beautiful mindset, and it's something that is espoused by Warren Buffett, who, of course, doesn't like Bitcoin or anything like <laughs> that. But, but he talks about, like, you know, you should get areas of competence and you should, you know, kind of get excited about those areas, right? So you should you should look at things that you, you believe in and, and you trust. Um, on an aside, like, this led my investment firm to invest in one inch and one inch is of course a very gangbusters project and the thing that i got excited about was actually getting to know them through the product over time right so as the product evolved under my feet like i i got the feeling of like oh this is a surging powerhouse you know and i think yep. that you know i've seen similar execution from zapper and zapper's team so congratulations to you for that which is you know we just see you know, as you're using the product, you're getting this kind of feeling of this power that you're, you know, it's like getting a Tesla car a, a software update that, uh, you know, self-drives, you know, like you, as you're using the product, it gets better and smarter and faster. And, you know, that, that always should give you a good feeling. And I think that's a methodology for investment that I think people should pay attention to, right, is they should, they should watch to see, you know, and that's one of the reasons why the pendulum kind of swung a little back from Uniswap towards sushi because they're executing right because you know mm -hmm. if you're using the product you're you're gonna notice it's getting better and better and that's that's great like you know people admire that and rightfully so yeah and i wanted like to, to touch back on the point like with warren buffett it's interesting because i had the um um uh podcast episode with and stani was in there and we were kind of hovering on that subject and we talked about, you know, well, why do uh, some people that kind of just miss these obvious things and you kind of, you kind of understand in a way that they, they invest in things they don't understand. And that is 99.9% .9 the strategy to do, right? You don't invest in stuff you don't understand. Yeah. And Sonny said something interesting. He said, well, that doesn't mean you have to stop learning new things and understanding new things. So that's important to tell, like I'd say to investors out there is don't stick to what you currently understand, actually seek knowledge to expand your investment horizon. Because if you only stick to what you know, yes, okay, you'll make good deals within that frame, but you won't be able to expand above what you know. You need to, you know, learn about new things to kind of expand your, your investment horizon. And I think just keep learning new stuff in DeFi is very important because um, that's, Kind of how you stay ahead uh, of the new trends if you understand them if you're a user then it becomes very obvious that it's kind of a good investment because you have the two most important things um that you basically need to convince an investor a traditional investor to invest like a, a example in the seed round like you're a user and you understand the problem perfectly that they're solving um which is very powerful to when you actually have that switch flick Oh, yeah. And I think that it goes all the way back to the beginning of the show when you talked about kind of like how you got started on this journey, which is you're scratching your own itch, right? You're like, I would love to be able to do it. By the way, this theme has kind of come up many times. You know, uh, I talked to Tyler at Barnbridge and he was saying, uh, I actually wanted to buy a certain kind of product that produced risk tokens, you know, and I went to Kane Warwick. And I said, hey, would you like to build this? Because I want to buy it. And he said, no, but why don't you build it? <laughs> you know, so <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. And I think obviously that more relates to the investment of people's time, right? Which is I'm investing my time because uh, I really understand this now. And I understand that it's a problem. But I, I love the orientation, the mindset. I think it's a very valuable mindset. And I think this idea of frontierism, I think one of the ways that you might do it, there's this concept in Bitcoin called no coiners. Right. Yeah. And in a way, no coiner is kind of a pejorative. It's a bit of an insult. And it kind of is a way to sort of invalidate people's opinions, you know. And I realize it's kind of a rhetorical technique and it's maybe a little unkind, but like the but there's something to it. Right. And and what I mean by there's something to it is is just buy one Satoshi for like five cents or I don't know one penny whatever it is i don't even know how much it is. Yeah. it's less than that actually but like yeah. just buy one satoshi and now you can talk right so you know obviously uh you know the ethereum gas prices are high so it's a little hard to buy one penny worth of anything without paying like you know ten dollars but like you know but i think that uh with all with all that being said you know um 
that's a great way to to learn right is is because there's we were talking about looking and doing right so when you yeah. go to zapper there's a lot of looking that you can do and i think you probably should do 90 90 to 99 percent looking before you do your one percent doing right but like the reality becomes that doing something actually gives you more things to look at too right so like yeah. in a way i think when you talk about like keep expanding your knowledge frontier there is not just studying but really like also playing right so there's you know and and the thing that i think is key about this kind of philosophy is you know just don't over deploy right like you know if you're if it's new if something's new to you just don't go bananas at it okay because like you're gonna lose it all like you know so so yeah. go go small and learn and that that's how you keep the frontier alive you know warren buffett was widely panned for missing most of the internet like he, you know, he he was like, uh, I don't really understand that. Like, you know, his investment methodology is you get a a single eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper and just write on the paper longhand. Like, why do why do I like this? You know, why do I like Coca Cola? And he would just write it out. You know, and if he couldn't articulate it nicely on a single sheet of paper, he wouldn't buy. He just like, nope, yep. nope, can't do it. Can't. Do, I don't get it. What are you doing? uh internet uh portal like what is this you know he's like no so you know he missed it but like you know it's just like when we go back to the big idea right you go back to the big idea and it's like if you laugh at warren buffett and say oh you missed this thing that happened it's like there's no human that missed that get, catches every single thing that ever happened right he was correct yep. about the big idea he has some big ideas follow the big ideas worked out fine you know he Yep. You know, it's and like, it's crazy because like, I'm just thinking back at like, so we're talking about the big idea and like often like in every kind of sector, it goes to like empowering the individual. If I look at media, right. Yeah. Podcasts, you have like Joe Rogan yep. that has a bigger audience than a bunch of like traditional media companies, which is crazy. Yeah. And it kind of always comes back to technology empowering the individual. And I see that, Kind of happening in all spheres um which is which is which is great uh which is great to see and i i think like this is a a very strong trend that you know we'll see as i said affect pretty much every market yes i love the ethos you know if you go back to the reverend dr martin luther king jr you know he said that the arc of history is long but it bends towards justice right and i think yeah. that that idea of empowerment, inclusivity, transparency, fairness, and equality, like these are all the values that come, you know, I think from open source and open source software, which is a consent based competition, right? So you're competing for consent, you're not competing for yeah. like dollars, you know, and because of that consent ethos, it can create this kind of new system for financial services so you know i think it's great it's and it's it's really nice to kind of chat with you you know catch catch your philosophy you know and really really kind of get get a much better feeling for it so i uh, really appreciate that it's sort of the soul behind the product that i admire so much so so please tell me uh you know as a kind of closing note you know this this i jokingly call leaking alpha segment which is about roadmap <laughs> it's about roadmap right which is what yeah. uh, do you have any upcoming launches releases features you know thing obviously you can go to zapper there's a community token support request you know uh segment but you you know what what do you have coming up that that you know we can all be excited to see there's a lot of things uh, that are coming. One of them is a mobile app that is coming soon. Wow. Yep. So you'll be able to refresh Zapper in your bed as much as you want. Ha. Uh, yep. And um, I love it. we also are working on um, uh, being able to mint um, tokenized Bitcoin on Ethereum easily through Zapper. Uh, wow. There's a lot of other features. I, I'd say those are the two those bigger ones that are coming. There's another one too, which is uh, having tracking over time of your portfolio, uh, which is, by the way, one of the toughest problems to solve uh, in Ethereum generally, because you kind of have to, there's a reason why you see a lot of products in Ethereum, they don't have historical balances. It's because it's 
for that reason, extremely hard to pull off. And um, without going too much into detail, that's something we absolutely want to solve. So we're going to uh, pour a lot of resources into that in the coming months. Wow. I'm super excited. Uh, me personally excited about the mobile zapper. Yep. Uh, that's a beautiful, wonderful thing. And, uh, you know, absolutely uh, been a great pleasure. So, uh, you know, please, please come back anytime and stay in touch. Yeah, awesome. Thank you very much, Miko. It was great to be here. Absolutely. Uh, great, great show. Thanks. Mm -hmm.